Hello everyone, Louis here. Let's talk C Sharp. So we talked about classes, we talked about properties, we talked about methods, and we know there are static methods and non-static methods. So that's good. So it seems to me that we're we're actually at a stage right now where we can we we could use a quick recap, right? So let's do that. For that, I'm going to create a new project. I'll right-click my solution here, say add new project. It's going to be a console application. I'll say next. I'll call this example 03. And um, I want to work with .NET 5, so that's good. All right, there's my project. So what I have to do, the first thing when I create a new project, I have to right click that project and say set as startup project. Good. The first thing I want to do here is I want to create a new class. And I'm going to call that class student. Okay, so I'll right click that folder now. I'll say add class. I have to make sure that the first option here is selected. Okay, so I'll do that. And I'll call this student. Perfect. Now what we said the other day was that in most cases, there is a one to one relationship between classes and tables. Okay, this is not always the case necessarily because there are many variables to look at. The main one being the design pattern. There's actually a collection of design patterns that we can use when implementing software. Okay, um, many of them actually rely on the on the assumption that you know, there's a one to one relationship between our classes and database tables. So what that means is that if I'm defining a student class, that means my database probably has uh, a student table. In that scenario, each entry you have in your database table, that's one object. Now, if there is really a one to one relationship between our classes and database tables, then each attribute in my class will have a database counterpart, right? So that student table will actually have one field for each student property. Okay. Now, again, there's a huge factor here of design patterns. Okay. Especially when you're creating your classes, you won't necessarily have every single property described in the table. Okay. You're going to have read only properties. You're going to have auto calculated properties. Um, there are going to be cases in which you may want to omit properties from the database. Okay, so there are many factors, but rule of thumb, this is usually how it works. Now, if that's the case, what is the most important attribute or property that I can have in my student class? Student number, student ID. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll go ahead and define a string student ID. Perfect. That's absolutely right. Now, what are other properties that I can define here? First name and another one for last name. What else? Yeah, there's a GPA. That's a very important one, actually. Um, so let's create that one. It'll be a double GPA. Um, maybe I'll have a date of birth. Now I'm looking at these properties here, right? And what I'm thinking is, are there any business rules that I can imagine that would make sense in this context? So the first one, this cannot be negative, right? Now there's another one here that says student ID should be unique. Now, what I'm thinking here is that, uh, yeah, my student ID, this should be unique, but also I don't want to have people going around in my code and changing the student ID. So this cannot be changed outside of this class. Okay. 
cannot be changed outside of the class. Let's go with that. Perfect. All right, so let's start with the GPA now. If this cannot be negative, what do I have to do? Yeah, so here's the thing. This is an auto-implemented property, right? So if we want to enforce business rules, the first thing we have to do is we have to change this definition. We have to make it a fully implemented property. So how do we do that? Well, the first step is I have to change the getters and setters. Okay, so I'm going to have a get and I'll have a dedicated scope for that get and same for the set. Okay, so that's step one or step zero. Now, step one is if this is a fully implemented property, I have to have a helper in order to uh, make this a fully implemented property. I'm going to declare fields and I'm going to declare properties and these are actually different things. Now I'm going to have to have a field to support with the implementation of this property and it's going to be a private field. That's really the nature of fields, right? They're, they're private. Well, most of the time they're private. They, they can be other things, but for now they're private. Okay. Now their data type kind of has to match here between, you know, the field itself and the property it's supporting. So if my GPA is double, that's going to be double too. And I'll say GPA. So the name is the same as the property. Okay. That's the convention, but fields are actually camel cased. Whereas properties are Pascal cased. Okay. So that's the, that's the difference. Now this effectively, this is where the GPA is stored. That's where the GPA is stored. Okay. So in this case, because this is a fully implemented property, this here, this will actually act like a gateway. It's a gateway between developers and the very place where the uh, information is being stored. Okay. All right. So let's start with the setter here. If I want to say that GPA cannot be negative, what does that mean? What do I have to do here? If value is less than zero, I can throw an error, right? So what I'm going to say is throw error else. Now, what, what does else mean here? What it means is if value is greater than or equal to zero, then I'm going to let that value in, right? So this dot GPA equals whatever value is coming in. Now, just a quick recap value. That's a reference. That's a keyword, right? It's a reference to whatever value is being passed into the property. Okay. Whatever value the property is being initialized to. Okay. So if value is less than zero, I'm going to throw an error. I won't do that right now. I don't know how to throw errors yet, um, but that's what I want to do. I want to throw an error eventually. If not, that means, well, that means the value is valid. Okay. So in that case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let that value in, meaning I'll actually store that value in the GPA field. Remember, that's where the GPA is effectively going to be stored. Okay. Perfect. Now, if this is true and that's the very place where the, uh, the GPA value is being kept, all I have to do in my getter is what, what is the most important thing I have to remember about getters? Exactly. They always return something, right? So return, I have to use the return keyword. After all, I'm returning this dot GPA. Okay. Perfect. This is a fully implemented property. Okay. And you have to know this. It's all about encapsulation, about hiding, you know, the, the implementation details behind the class. Now, the other thing is that student ID 
has to be unique and it cannot be changed outside of the class. So if that's the requirement, if it's a private set, that means, yeah, you can only assign values to student ID inside the student class. Perfect, so we got that covered. Now it has to be unique, and this is a, a bit of a tricky one. Okay, we have to initialize student ID to a value that's guaranteed to be unique. So here's a question. Where should I place initialization logic? Constructor. Okay. And there I have my first constructor. Okay. What do I mean by initialization logic? Well, that's the code that I need to be executed every time a new object is created. So whenever the student class is instantiated, if I need to execute any logic, that's the place to do it. Okay, so for example, I have to make sure that an ID, well, for one, it has to have a value, right? That's the first thing. And the second thing is, it has to be unique. So how do I do that? It's easy. In C sharp, it's easy. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say this dot student ID equals, look at that, GUID dot new GUID dot to string. What am I doing here? Well, I'm initializing student ID. Okay, whose student ID? Well, the student ID of this object, this very object that's being instantiated right now. Okay, the one that I'm calling this constructor co uh, for. Okay, now what I'm doing here is I'm initializing to something called GUID. GUID stands for Global Unique Identifier or globally unique identifier. Both definitions are correct. You're gonna find literature using both terms. Okay, globally unique identifier or global unique identifier. We can simply call the new GUID method and it's going to generate a new GUID for us. So what we have to do, because we defined the student ID as a string, we have to call the toString method to convert that value to a string. So this is going to produce a string that is guaranteed to be unique. Okay. And I'll say this has to be unique and cannot be changed outside of this class. This cannot be negative, fully implemented property needed for validation. Okay, now there's something that we need to create in order to make this class a little more complete. Methods. Methods are procedures, right? They're procedures that accomplish a task. Okay, they're responsible for carrying out a task. Okay, they encapsulate algorithm that, well, makes something happen. And there are two categories of methods. We have static methods and we have non-static methods. Okay, the main difference here is that static methods attach themselves to classes. Non-static methods attach themselves to objects. Now that's where the implementation go and I'll just say console right line. I'm studying. Okay, perfect. Now, this is a very simple example. We're just doing a quick recap here. Um, so it doesn't really matter that, you know, the method is not, it's not very complicated. Okay, the, uh, the message here is that method logic goes here. 
whatever it is that you need that method to do, that's where the logic should go. Okay. Perfect. I mean, we do have our class now, so we should probably instantiate it. Right? So let's do it. What I'm going to say is student, student equals new student. Perfect. I have an error because, well, program lives in that namespace, example three, and student lives in example three dot model. So it's not the same namespace, right? So what I have to do is I have to let my program class know where to look for a student. Okay, so I'll have to if, uh, effectively add a using statement to the top of the file using example three dot models, which is the very namespace where student is declared. Okay. Awesome. And as you can see, the error goes away. So perfect. Now what I have to do, since I have a few properties, Let's go ahead and initialize them. So student dot first name equals um, Clark. Student dot last name equals what's a good last name for Clark? Can't. I don't see why not. Uh, and there's the date of birth. So let's initialize date of birth too. That's new date time. I hope you remember how to do that. The first parameter is the year. So I don't remember Clark. I don't remember Clark Kent's birthday. So I'll just go ahead with this one. And from here, I can actually call my study method. So it can just go ahead and say student dot study, not student ID. Study. Look at that. Again, look, it's a method that attaches itself to the student object. So it's a non-static method. Perfect. That's exactly how we defined it. Okay. And if I run this. Yeah. Awesome. I am studying. So this works. So yeah, perfect. Now, one thing that I should say is that we should never, ever ever have console write line statements inside our classes. The reason for that is this example, it just happens to be a console application. Okay. This is not going to be the case every time. Okay. You can use .NET to implement, um, say web applications, right? And if that's what you're doing and you go to your domain classes and say, Hey, I'm going to do a console write line here that's not going to do anything for you. Okay. You won't see that message anywhere because it's not a console app. It's a web application. Although in .NET, yes, I know web applications in .NET are actually console applications, but we don't know that. We don't know that yet. Now, if you have any questions, you can always ask in the comments or shoot me an email. I'll be happy to help. See ya.